Welcome everyone to the SDL Cyber Meetup. Really glad you could all make it out tonight. Uh, once again, pizza, drinks, free beer, help yourselves. Tonight, presenting for us, we have Craig Reitz, president of the St. Louis ISC Squared chapter. He'll be presenting on the 10 steps to manage your career. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so this is not really a technology talk, but I think it's something that's really important. As I was saying, uh, uh, as we were talking here, uh, my wife is going through a, a job transition right now and uh, you know what she's doing. And I have fielded the question so many times, how did you get into cybersecurity? Um, that kind of fed me into creating this presentation. So I came up with what, uh, I say 10 steps, there's actually probably 11 or 12 <laughs> if you break it down. But um, what I found is that a lot of people just kind of let their careers happen, okay? And that's not the way that it really should go. You need to take control of it and, and manage that whole process. So let's start off with this question. What's the definition of a business? Learn this in like day one, you know, of you know, any like business 101 class in college. Something that makes money. Exactly. An entity that exists for the sole purpose of making money. That's what a business is. So you need to think of yourself as a business. Okay. You know, you're managing your own business. So you're the CEO of me incorporated. Okay, you work for, you don't work for a company like, for instance, I work for four step right now. Technically, they give me a paycheck, but I work for my family, my, my wife and myself. You know, that's who I work for. So, you know, never say no to something that may open a new door to you. This is important because I am the original boy who just can't say no. <laughs> and it has gotten me into some really cool situations because I, I do that. And throughout everything, you need to have a positive attitude. Nobody wants to work with somebody who has a negative attitude. You know, I mean, we all know that one person on the team has got the negative attitude. Is that the person you want to go out to lunch with? Is that the person you want to help advance their career? Not really. You know, be that positive person that's you know always up for the challenge, that kind of thing. So a good business invests in itself. Okay. So you know, learn all you can, learn all that's learnable. You know, go back to the original Star Trek movie. You know. <laughs> where Beecher's mission was to learn all that was learned. You know, that should be your mission too. Um, you know, and we do that by getting degrees, by getting certifications, and finding ways to make ourselves valuable. Okay, to an, you know, and that makes us more employable. Now, this is where we can run into a problem. If we say, if I know this, and nobody else knows it, then that makes me valuable. Okay, that's kind of a data side when you think about it. Okay, um, a very wise man that I worked for um, years ago when I was started out in the engineering field and then moved over into IT. Um, but while I was in the engineering field, um, I went to work for a guy who was one of my father's best friends. Okay. And one day we're sitting there at lunch and I said, boy, you know, I know something that, that you don't know that makes me valuable. And he goes, yeah, I've never had this talk. And I said, what? And he says, the only person 
was irreplaceable in this world. It was a person who could stick his hand in a bucket of water and leave an impression. And that stuck with me ever since. When a company figures out more things they can do without you, they will. So what do I need to do to make sure that I'm valuable enough that they don't ever think of trying to do without me? Okay. Now, this guy took it to the extreme. He never took more than two days of vacation in a row because he was afraid if he was gone for an entire week, they'd say, well, we didn't need it for a week. You don't need it. <laughs> so anyway, but you know, making yourself you know, valuable is, is you know, one of the most important things. And if you guys have questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to, to jump in. Maintain visibility. Don't be shy. Okay. Um, you know, don't let yourself be ignored. Be the, you know, they say, they say, hey, we need somebody to speak. You're the first hand up. Hey, we need, you know, this, we need that. You know, um, don't be afraid to step out there and, you know, get your name out there. Um, one of the things, get your name on every single document whatever email that you can, et cetera. I mean, you know, because people think about who they've talked to or who they've seen, you know, um, you know, on an email string or whatever. Um, I'm always, um, well, just today, um, one of our sales guys came to me and he says, hey, do you got time? I've got a customer that's got some technical questions and I can't answer them. You know, because of the contacts I've had with him, I was the first person he thought of to you know, pull into the conversation. And that customer will eventually become one of my customers in, in what I do. So, um, so it's, that's the important thing. Get your name out there, get that recognition so that you're the person who solves people's problems. Okay. Network acting. <clears throat> okay. When people think of networking, there's, you know, times like this where you get together with a bunch of people or they think of LinkedIn. I've got 5,000 connections on LinkedIn. Yeah, maybe you do. How many of those people do you actually have a relationship with very few, very, very few, right? Um, when you make a connection on LinkedIn or even in person, what do they bring to the relationship? What do you bring to the relationship? How can you solve their problem? What makes you valuable to them and what makes them valuable to you? Okay. Um, you need to, to, you know, generate that goodwill with them that, you know, you're somebody that can help them, that you're somebody that can answer questions that, um, you know, and that kind of thing. And in fact, career opportunities come out of this. Okay. Um, back, um, you know, when the, when the whole pandemic thing started that April of, of 2020, started. Um, the company I was working for uh, did a lot of work for like Ameren and other electrical utilities and that kind of thing. Um, every single one of them locked down so that our people couldn't get in to do their work. Right? So we had all these contracts, but we couldn't perform them because we couldn't get into the facilities to on the work. So they came along and they said, okay, who don't we need? And they decided they didn't need me. Okay. I was unemployed for 25 minutes. I got a telephone call. They said, you need to come in, give us your laptop and everything. We don't work here anymore. I'm in the car, I'm driving. I live out in Winsville. I'm driving out to Westport. Pick up the phone, 
call some people at uh, another company that I knew that did uh, <coughs> operational technology and cybersecurity. And I said, I'm available. And I said, no, you're not. So before I even got to my former employer to turn in my equipment, I already had another job and I started the next Monday. So that's where networking helped me out. I mean, I knew, I knew these people, I knew they had a need. We had been talking about their need and I was able to jump in and fill their need. Um, and I, re I refer to that job as, as a bridge job. It wasn't the job that I wanted, but it was a paycheck until I got the one that I, that I wanted. Okay, that's something that you need to consider. You know, take a job, may not be the job, but it's a paycheck. You know, and work it while you find the job. So. <coughs> Scan the market. Keep an eye on the job market. Okay, um, you know, look for other possible avenues. Um, when I went to work for a company um, that uh, I refer to as the biggest company that nobody's ever heard of, it's a company called DMDGI. They're actually headquartered out of uh, Norway, um, but. Uh, I went to work for them and um, was running a rebate program for a uh, utility. You know, just like how Ameren does when you get a new air conditioner, you give your money back, you know, that kind of thing. I was running this project, it had nothing at all to do with IT. And that was part of the reason why the guy who hired me, hired me because he was like, you think differently than all the other project managers I've talked to. So I'm gonna hire you and I went in there, and, you know, took a trouble project, fixed it. Well, while I was working there, I had a telephone call from a guy who did what's called NERC compliance, works with electric utilities on their cybersecurity compliance. And um, he says, the very first, you know, like pick up the phone, I'm like, hello, this is Craig. And he's like, why are you working the job that you're working? Because this is what they hired me to do. <laughs> well, when? <laughs> is that the right answer? And he says, with the experience you've got, you should be working for me. And um, I'm like, well, how did you find me? And he says, I saw an article that you wrote on how to hack an electric utility. He says, uh, you know, he says, you show some promise and we need to talk. So we talked and I ended up shifting over to his department and, um, you know, started doing the, uh, you know, cybersecurity for um, electric utilities. Um, and, uh, really interesting stuff. And uh, it was kind of funny after working for it for like a year. I went back and I read the article, the, the paper that he had read. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, because I learned all kinds of new stuff since I wrote that. And I went back to him and I was like, what made you hire me? <laughs> it's like, I reread that paper last night. It's like, dude, what were you thinking? And he goes, you showed promise. He said, no. And, he, and uh, he says, now, he says, what I'd like you to do is go back and rewrite that. And uh, so I did. And um, it actually uh, was um, one of the first articles that I had published in 2600 magazine. Do I know 2600? Okay, yeah. So I just sent them a new article last night that will hopefully be the third one that I can publish. <coughs> Um, on uh, uh, geopolitical hacking. So, um, but um, that's where you, know, you need to look at other possibilities. I had never considered doing cybersecurity for 
electric utilities. Never even crossed my mind. And that built into um, me transitioning into another department called Digital Solutions, where I ended up doing cybersecurity for critical infrastructure, all critical infrastructure. Okay. I actually got to go and do penetration tests on oil rigs. Okay. One of them in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Louisiana, and the other one off the coast of Singapore, which was cool. Someday I'm going to go back and actually see some of those because <laughs> I didn't. Um, but um, you know, make sure that you understand and appraise what you already have. This is important in that before you make a, a jump to another job, think about the job that you've got. Okay, what exactly is wrong with it? Okay, and can those things be fixed? You know, do the opportunities that this new job will give you outweigh the opportunities you have where you are? So, some things to think about. Um, keep interview skills current. Okay, so interview for practice. You may not be looking for a job, but somebody calls you up and they say, Hey, you got a job, we think you'll be interested in this. Go ahead and do the interview just to, you know, and especially, my gosh, interviews have changed so much in the last couple of years because, you know, you went from face to face, in person interviews to, you know, Zoom calls or, you know, team, Teams meetings or whatever. And that's a totally different, I mean, it, it, it's sometimes tougher to read the room in those. Um, you know, so do some practice interviews um, and read up on interview trends. I mean, you know, there's always something on, you know, LinkedIn or something that you know, talks about, you know, what the current trends are as far as interviews and the types of questions that they're asking and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, really, you know, some good information if you look for it. So manage your relationships. Um, so this sounds kind of kind of bad the way that I stated it, but manage your boss and your coworkers. Okay. You need to do a little bit of social engineering of people that you work with. Okay. Um, not that you're, you know, not in the, you know, evil Kevin Mitnick type way, <laughs> but in the way of, you know, steering them in the direction that you want to go. You know, um, you know, and that's, you know, bringing something of value to them. Yes, we can do that. And we'll all look really good if we do this. You know, compared to sitting there going, no, I don't want to do that. You know, give an option for them and you can steer them where you want to go. Um, one of the things that my dad used to say all the time, be nice to people on your way up because you might see them again on your way back. Um, so, you know, you never know who you're going to be working with in the future. So, um, you know, be nice, you know, um, to, to everybody. And emotional intelligence. Um, this is something that um, is very difficult for a lot of techie people, okay? Um, it's understanding humans. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'll be the first one to tell you that, that my wife has, we've been, we've been married for 38 years and she's almost got me to the level of being human. Um, she's taught me things that I didn't know before. <laughs> um, just because, you know, as IT people, we think too logically sometimes, you know, and I'm like, why should I buy you a birthday card 
because you're going to read it. I'm going to spend five bucks on this card. You're going to read it, and then you're going to throw it in the trash. So I might as well just come up with a five dollar bill and throw it in the trash. You know, I had to learn that people like that kind of thing. <laughs> you know? um, and so you know, that's that the whole empathy thing that you know. Um, I, I, you know, constantly have to ask my wife, how should I be feeling about this? <laughs> you know, um, because sometimes I don't know. You know, and, and I think that's a problem with a lot of IT people. We can't relate, you know, to people. And that's why we get that um, stereotypical image of the guy who sits in the dark room in the corner and clicks away on his keyboard because he'd rather not talk to people. So, you know, technical, uh, technical ability is no longer enough to get you to the next level. You know, um, people don't care how much you know, they want to know that you care about other people and that they're not going to throw people under the bus just to get what you, where you want to go. Okay, so now we get into one of my favorite areas. Prioritize and balance your needs. So this, we start kind of getting into that work-life balance, which doesn't exist, forget it. The term's made up, it doesn't really work. <laughs> you may never have everything you want at the same time, okay? Um, so you have to manage the situations that you're in. Um, you know, you're, you know, you've got a meeting at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, but your wife needs you to drop off, you know, the kids at school and they can't be dropped off until eight o'clock. <laughs> so how do you, you know, how do you manage things? You know, one of the great things with, you know, virtual meetings now is I can be, in a meeting while I'm sitting in the drop off line, you know, just tell my granddaughter to be quiet next to me. <laughs> Grandpa loves you, but be quiet. <laughs> and um, so, you know, you have to, you know, work those situations, manage those situations. Um, you know, occasionally you have to do something that you don't particularly want to do in order so you can do something that you want to do. Okay, um, you know, take for instance, um, you know, I have a meeting this evening when I get home at 8.30 tonight um, because I didn't want to get up at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> um, which is one of the downfalls. I work with companies in Saudi Arabia, Australia, um, you know, et cetera. And I have, you know, and Singapore, and I have to work my schedule around their schedule. But, you know, and, and sometimes that means being up at night and sleeping during the day. You know, so, you know, sometimes I have to do those things that I don't want to do in order to continue to have my job and, um, you know, that kind of thing. Or, um, you know, to, uh, you know, a um, great example is that um, back in March, um, my wife really wanted to go. Um, our daughter just moved to Florida. She wanted us to come and visit. I'm like, I can't get away for a week right now to go on vacation. And um, so I did what's called the work vacation. Okay, so we went to Florida. I spent from eight to five, in, you know, sitting in the hotel room, clicking away at the keyboard. And then at five o'clock, I went and hung out with my daughter and her family. You know, so I was able to do both things, but I had to give up being with them during the day so that I could be there at all. So, you know, that's a 
example of doing something that you particularly don't want to do. Um, you know, the uh, hotel maid service was kind of like, sure, Florida, what are you doing sitting in a hotel room all day? <laughs> it's like, because your Wi Fi sucks. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then over time, your needs change. Um, so there, it's a continual balancing act to reevaluate your priorities. Um, you know, and, and think about that as, you know, my priorities were different when I had, you know, kids in, in junior high, high school, you know, now they're married and gone. And, you know, now as long as, uh, you know, I take some time off, my wife is happy. So, um, so you need to manage change to your advantage. Change is inevitable. It's the universal constant. That change is always going to come around. And in business terms, to not catch the wave means that you could be wiped out. So you think about you know, our, our business uh, scenario that we were talking about earlier. If you don't make those changes, if you don't learn that new skill or whatever, you could be left behind and not be valuable and employable as you go into the future. You know, um, I once saw a sign that said, if you're on a bike and coasting, the only place to go is downhill. Okay. And that was related then to business. If you're coasting and you see so many of these people and they're like, I'm 63, I'm going to retire in two years, I'm going to sit back and coast. You know, I'm going to be working my butt off until the, the day I have a plug. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way that, that you have to be. Um, you have the choice to respond with flexibility. Okay. You know, you can, you know, gee, that sounds like a great opportunity. Here's what I think. Here, how can we make this opportunity work? Okay, so have some flexibility in it. And look for the opportunities change gives you okay and, and that what we're saying is there's always in change there's always an opportunity of some sort okay look for that opportunity and say how is this going to you know help me to get to the next stage or what can i use here to make my life better through this change And then 10, have a fallback plan. At some point, you will lose your job. Okay, you will get that call. Hey, we come drop off your stuff. We don't need you anymore. <laughs> and um, you know, I say, what's your plan B? Because, you know, let's face facts, plan A never works. You know, and so you should always have a plan B. Um, you know, and I think. You know, for me, um, and in the cybersecurity world, you know, we do that contingency plan. We do that, you know, worst case scenario planning. Okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, zombie apocalypse. Okay, how are we going to keep the company working? You know, as people are becoming zombies. You know, um, you know and so you need to have those plans in place, those contingency plans in place before you need them. When you need, you know, um, back when, uh, uh, and this has been way too many years ago, but uh, there was this uh, quote unquote scientist that was predicting that uh, the new matter fault was gonna go when, when again, you know, um, we keep on waiting for it to happen. It hasn't ever happened. But at the time, I was working in Illinois and living in Missouri. Okay. Well, I had contingency plans. If the earthquake comes and say every bridge falls, 
Okay, how do I get back to Missouri? Any answer to that? The ferry. <laughs> That's right. You have to drive up near Pure Marquette Park to jump on the Golden Eagle Ferry and take it, you know, back over. You know, but that was part of my contingency plan. If something went wrong, how was I going to get home? You know, and that may seem like, you know, you know, an out there example, but we need to have, you know, if I lose my job tomorrow, what's my plan? Okay, what am I doing that, you know, what's, what's my plan, you know, and, um, you know, the way I look at it is when I'm out of work, my job is finding another job. Okay, so I'm never truly out of work. I may not be getting a paycheck, but, you know, I've got a job to do. Okay, and that's part of that operating as a business. I have to make sure that I continue to bring in money. So, you know, when I see these people and they post on LinkedIn, oh, well, you lost your job. So, you know, take a little while and think about what's important to you and what you really, you know, what your next opportunity looks like, stuff like that. My next opportunity looks like somebody who wants to make money. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um, you know, and if it has to be, as I said before, a bridge job, you know, it may not be the perfect job, but it's a job that's going to pay me money until I can get that job that I want. You know, and this job that I took, you know, during the pandemic, and I actually worked it from April until January, I was working at almost half the pandemic while I was doing that job. But I was working. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that's, you know, the kind of thing that you have to consider. You know, um, you know, the paycheck's the most important thing. I'm sorry. You know, it's all about that. And anybody who tells you that they're working a job just because they like it makes them money. Okay, tell you what. If you worked there for free, would you still think it was that much fun? Probably not, you know, you know, so every company has to follow, um, has, every company has to follow, and you should too, company vision statement, okay, a business plan, you know, how are you going to continue to make money, what are you going to do? And then the biggest thing is you have to define what success is for you. Okay. So an example of that is success for me is to be there for my family, have enough money to pay the bills, go on trips and vacations, and have a job that I can make a difference. Okay. Um, you know, do I feel like the job that I have, which, you know, I, I currently work for Four Scout. I do, um, I'm a professional services engineer. Um, so I go in and make sure that their software is configured correctly, that, um, you know, their sensors are communicating and picking up information from the network and then helping them to understand what exactly the alerts that they're seeing. <laughs> you know. So, you know, and knowing that I have made um, an, electric, an electrical utility more secure that they're going to be able to keep the lights on. Um, that, um, you know, some hacker isn't going to be able to, to uh, shut down the uh, drill system on an oil rig. You know, that's all, that's important stuff to me. You know, um, you know but. To me, you know, and, and when my son graduated, from, was graduating from high school, um, he came to me and he says, I don't want to go to college. Exactly. Like, okay. He says, I want to be an auto mechanic. And I kind of, you know, he'd always tinker with his cars and stuff like that. 
And I said to him, I said, I don't care what you do as long as it's legal. You know, as long as it's legal, as long as you feel good about what you're doing, I don't care what you do. And he went to school, he got an auto mechanics degree um, from a community college and worked as an auto mechanic for a while and decided that he couldn't make any money unless he actually owned the shop. So now he's part owner in a landscaping company. <laughs> so, and uh, he makes use of his automotive training and everything by repairing, you know, he spends his winter repairing all the equipment, all the landscaping equipment, you know, because they just, you know, run it like crazy all summer long. And then, uh, you know, he spends his winter just rebuilding everything. Yeah. And uh, that's a good life for him. So, um, questions, comments, comments? Yeah. You were talking about making yourself employable by, I don't know, degree and all that. But a lot of people say that, uh, like nowadays, experience is worth uh, as much as a degree. Right. Um, so I was wondering uh, what your experience with that is for opening businesses. Yeah, and I, I, I agree that experience is probably more important than anything else. Um, and I wish I could get that through the heads of a lot of HR departments um, because they see, um, you know, years of, you know, years of experience or years of college or, you know, something like that. And, you know, we've all heard that story of, um, you know, they say, you know, well, we're looking for somebody with five years of experience in this technology. And it's like, the technology has only been around for three. <laughs> you know, you're never going to find anybody, you know, unless you went to the person who developed that technology and maybe they have five years of experience working with it. But, you know, it's only been in the market for three. Um, you know, I, I you know, and I think along with that is that willingness to learn new things. Um, that's what makes somebody, you know, valuable is that they know, um, I've always had a saying, um, there's nothing I can't do, just things I haven't done yet. Okay. If you give me something, you say, figure this out. I'll figure it out. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to in order to figure it out. People know that. And the people that don't know that end up being surprised sometimes when they didn't really expect an answer and they get it. <laughs> um, you know, and, and um, you know, that's, yeah, and, and, you know, so that's the kind of thing. You know, you always have to be building your value with people by, you know, gaining that new experience, gaining that, you know, and that's how you become valuable. Um, getting that first job, getting in the door, is probably one of the hardest things. Um, and I found here lately um, that you can get into certain niche markets of cybersecurity and you just better be happy that you're there because you're going to be in that niche for the rest of your career um, unless something happens. Um, I'm finding that I have been out of IT long enough that people go, well, uh, <laughs> I mean, I left, I left IT cybersecurity in 2014. And have been doing OT cybersecurity ever since. And the principles are the same but different. Um, everybody know what the CIA triad is? Okay, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Okay, in OT, it's the AIC triad. 
availability, integrity, and confidentiality. Okay, in OT, they care about is it up and running? Because if we're not making widgets, I'm not making money. Okay. Where for IT, that's the last thing that's important to them. Is it is if you know things are available, they want to make sure that nobody's hacking into their stuff and you know that everything's secure. And the fact that people can get the stuff is low on the total. So um I know I'm kind of rambling and stuff, but did I answer your, your question? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, experience is important. Um, but unfortunately in the in the environment that we're in, degrees get HR's attention so that you can get past the gatekeeper. Yeah. I mean, if you can find out who the hiring manager is and get straight to them, sometimes you can sidestep HR. They can go to HR and go, I want to talk to this person. There's something to say to that too. Like, uh, I think one thing I've seen people is like, they might have that experience or they might have that ex exposure, but they just don't know how to properly show that yeah. uh, or kind of make it known for people. Uh, so that's something else. Like, like, definitely gather all that and see how you could kind of just explain it in a manner that, you know, you do have that exposure, you do have the knowledge and willing to learn more. Uh, and just use that to your advantage. See, um, that, that's one of those other things that goes back to when I was talking about getting yourself out there and all. Um, you can have the most brilliant idea in the entire world, but if you can't present that idea to people, somebody else is going to take your idea and present it as theirs. Plain and simple, it's going to happen. You know, don't be afraid to get up there and go, you know, jump up on your desk and go, I got a great idea. <laughs> you know, um, and make it known. You know, hey, you know, you know, all I need is is a camel, two monkeys, and a dog, and we can do something really cool. <laughs> you know, so I have a question in the okay. Zoom. Kathy, you raised your hand. Yes. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to share my networking experience with you guys. So perhaps some of you can take something away from this. When I originally found out about the ISC2 group, it was through a gentleman in the cyber meetup and he had invited me for an interview, which I did. And I did not get that job, but he told me about ISC too. And I started attending their meetings every month. And then sometime down there at the time I started out, I was not even pursuing a certificate. I had my master's in cybersecurity and I didn't feel that I needed a certificate, but I found out sometime later, I got a contract over at Scott Air Force Base, and they wanted me to have that CISSP. So I went to get the CISSP, and after you pass the test, it requires that you have someone vouch for you. And that's when I reached out to Craig, and Craig jumped right on it and, took, and, and got me the rest, rest of the way in on my CISSP. So it's kind of interesting to me the different ways that networking helps you out when you don't even expect it. So go to all of the meetings that you can because you never know when that next bridge is going to happen. For those of you who don't have your CISSP, when you get when you pass the test, then they have to um, verify your character and that kind of thing. But it has to be done by another person who has CISSP certification. Okay, so yeah, Kathy said, "Hey, can you do this for me?" And it's just popping online and going, you know, no, she's not a hacker. No, she hasn't blown anything up. She's a good person. Give her the certificate. <laughs> and you know, it's 
you know, and, and I'm always there to help. And, and I enjoy helping people. And so, by the way, my, Craig, I also yes. need to get your, I need the landscaper so you can get me your son's company's information. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that for you. So, um, you know, here's my contact information. This is my email address, my telephone number. I don't mind giving that out. And um, even my LinkedIn. Um, so you can uh, look me up on LinkedIn, um, see all the wild and wonderful things that I've done in my career. Because my, uh, my LinkedIn profile is basically my resume. So you find the best way to do LinkedIn if you're going to do it. Yeah. So, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity.